please join me in the responsive reading printed in our bulletin. Blessed is one who comes in the divine name. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Blessed be all who enter this house. Good morning. Welcome to Fountain Street Church. Most of the welcomes I've heard are from people who have been here for years. My name is Jacqueline Pullman, and I'm a newbie among the veterans, having only been at Fountain Street Church for a year this past Sunday. I came here seeking a place of peace and reflection amid the crazy days after my daughter Claire was born in July in 2013. You'll see her with me in the nursery sometimes. She insists on wearing pink, sparkly shoes everywhere she goes. This church welcomes us anyways. The first few weeks I attended services here, it was hard for me to talk to people because I was embarrassed about the fact that I was crying while listening to almost every sermon. Stories about forgiveness, about trust, about passion and love, about why bad things happen to good people, and about serving others. And you know what? I realized after a few weeks that I was not the only person who was overcome by emotion at the life-changing works that stem from this community. This church welcomes all of us anyways. I think I truly fell in love with Fountain Street when it was said to me, this church has no beliefs. You are allowed to think what you want and then change your mind. As long as you approach others with kindness and tolerance, this church welcomes you. As a busy mom of two who works full time, I'll admit I haven't had the chance to check out many of the opportunities offered here. There are more things that I want to do, people I want to help, and knowledge I want to gain than I will probably ever have time to complete in this lifetime. This church is a home for the givers, and this church welcomes me. I can attest that even after a short time, I belong here at Fountain Street Church. Thank you.
As we begin this, pro this moment of recognition and honor, I'd like to ask our, our Governing Board Chair, Brian Walters, and our Volunteer Ministries Coordinator, Eliza Ingram, to join us to signify the full range of our community as we welcome our newest members. So this morning, as we honor our newest members, we recognize that this signifies their desire to be full participants in this place, in this community, by having signed our membership book in recent weeks. These individuals have explored what being a part of this community is about by attending services and programs, by meeting people in the social hall, by attending the Inquirer series. They have reflected on their spiritual journeys and they have met staff and lay leaders. Today, we recognize them for choosing this place as their spiritual home. And so as I read the names, and if you are here with us this morning, please come forward. Jim Ayers, Nancy Ayers, Carl Houston and Kathy Houston, Thomas Robinson, Kathy Robinson, Amy Preston, Ted Perkins, Jill Perkins, and Ricky Sakshong. Why do we come to church? It is possible to feel and express reverence, awe, and thanks at any time, really and in any place, to take a pause from our labors in order to consider and to name what is of deep and lasting value. What we cannot do, however, by ourselves is to be present with others. Without other people, we cannot know the fullness of reverence, the depth of awe, the tenderness of our gratitudes. Without others, we have no living reference for the intimate and the ultimate in our midst. And this is indeed why we make something called a congregation. And, but why this particular congregation? Those who become members here, we, we like to think of you as disciples in the original sense, meaning students. Members of Fountain Street Church are students of life, of truth, of the truth within each of you and the truth that connects all of us. They are disciples of goodness, filled with the hope that we can all be better than we have been and must become if the world is to survive. They are disciples of beauty not as mere decoration, but as a prophetic sign of the fullness of life itself. But we are also, of course, more than students. We are teachers, lifelong teachers and teachings, sharing our wisdom. We might dare say that we are prophets and prophetesses that living our principles. And we might also dare say that we are saviors simply because we are in the company of one another and show up for one another and redeem the world through acts of faith, hope, love, and joy. So we have a question for you. Do you, by joining this church, dedicate yourself to a life of discipleship, of learning, of prophecy, and of teaching? If so, please respond, I do. This is a mighty task, it's not always easy, and it is one that is lifelong. And so we are in need of the support of one another. Mm -hmm. This church, those people out there and all the others, they promise to stand with you and sustain you as you walk this path of our faith. Now, will you, the congregation, welcome them as fellow disciples of truth and goodness and beauty? Will you learn from them as well as teach them? Follow them as well as leave them? Receive their gifts as well as give your own? If so, please answer, we will. We will. Thank you very much. 
sharing our vision of a world where everyone is a student, a teacher, a prophet, and a savior. That is what we are here to do. We bid you to free your mind and grow your soul and change the world just by being in it. Welcome. Welcome to our members. Would you like to welcome our newest members as we give them our gratitude? Thank you so much. Thanks to one and all, our choir, who you will be performing later today, so I give you a double thumbs up for doing two shows today. That's good duty, and to our guest musicians and performers, Judas, you rock, dude. <laughs> and for those who don't know, this all happens because we have a plant in the uh, musical theater business here in town. Wright McCarger basically owns that shop, so thank you, Wright McCarger. 
And I know that applause is an odd experience in church, but exuberance sometimes is the right thing we need to share. And short of of cat calls and whistles, which if you feel so inclined, but that's another (laughs) matter. Now, good try, but I've got the biggest whistle in this house. Don't make me use it. (laughs) I kid you not. Now let's get all churchy, okay? Uh, it should be observed that the, that the story of uh, Palm Sunday is just an episode in a long story, and it traditionally begins what is called Holy Week. After it was all over, though, the triumphal entry, which, as Jason reminded you, was more mockery than it was uh, majesty, he went back. I mean, he went into Jerusalem and essentially said, okay, let's go back now, and went back to the town of Bethany where he met up with Martha and Mary and his disciples, and they spent the evening together. And in the middle of that, a woman of unnamed, uh, unnamed in fact, uh, came in with a a jar of ointment, uh, very fragrant, and opened it up and anointed Jesus' feet, uh, which is a very humbling thing to do. Remember, people didn't have shoes. His feet were likely rather dirty. And so it's a a gesture of humility and service. And the disciples, some of them, chastise her for using what could have been sold and distributed to the poor for this wasteful act. To which Jesus replies in the Gospel of Mark, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body before its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Many centuries later, Ralph Waldo Emerson, a a prophet of the American possibility, the father of transcendentalism, prophet of my native Unitarian faith, said, A person will worship something, have no doubt about that. That which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship, for what we are worshiping, we are becoming. And Albert Einstein, brilliant in so many ways, Observe that the most beautiful and profound emotion we can experience is the sensation of the mystical. It is the dower of all true science. The one to whom the emotion is a stranger who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. To know that what is impenetrable to us really exists. This knowledge, this feeling, is at the center of true religiousness. And so to my words. Walt Frazier, the great basketball player, was born this week in 1945. Jimmy Stewart was promoted to colonel after having enlisted in the army during the war and enlisted as a private, one of only four men in the entire armed services to go from private to colonel in the space of the war, and between movies, no less. The U.S. Army put a bridge over the River Remagen on this day in 1945, among others, beginning the invasion of Germany. And on this Palm Sunday, In 1945, Duncan Littlefair concluded his first and probably most memorable Lenten series on the nature of God. Lent traditionally ends on Palm Sunday, you know. That's also, in case you didn't know, my other predecessor, David Rankin's favorite holy day. Auspicious, I think. In a different church, the First Unitarian Church of Chicago, in a Gothic revival building where I was married almost 39 years ago, there are two doors in the chancel area to the left and right as we have here, but it's a Gothic revival building, and there are carvings on the stone walls, and over one over there on that side is a cradle, and over the other door on this side 
is a coffin. They are there to remind the officiant, that would be me, of the doorways of birth and death. That mystery is where I began my series so many weeks ago, not with the reality of God, but with the mystery of life. Does it matter? Is there any meaning to it? We have dwelt in these questions, resisting the headlong urge to answer them too rapidly, trying to notice their simplicity and their gravity. That mystery, I hope, in the spirit of Einstein, is still present. Keeping ourselves aware of it is the challenge we ever face, and every sermon by every preacher should resist the urge to answer your questions and bid you instead to dwell in the mystery as long as you can. With that hope, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be found true in thy sight. Thou who art my rock and my redeemer. And so, after four sermons, I have arrived at only two conclusions. If you counted up Duncan Littlefairs, they'd be 15 or 20, so I'm well behind. The first is that the reality that we live in from the Big Bang all the way down to the decay of atomic particles is one substance, one thing. There is no need for another reality than this one to make it or sustain it or explain it. There is no need for a supernatural realm where God presumably looks out over the precipices of heaven and watches and manages. As wild and weird as it is, it is nonetheless one reality that takes everything in, including all facts and all truth. And what holds it together from that Big Bang down to those quarks and bosons is what I call love. Not a feeling, but a cohesiveness, a connection that at its most mindless is gluing protons and neutrons together and at its most immense is propelling galaxies and swirls and twirls. But in its mindful form as we know it is love. That thing that gives us connection, and wholeness. That's my first point that I arrived at. The second was that our task in this universe is to knit the truth together with the love, to love what is true and not what is false, to give love a worthy object, something worthy of our worship, as Emerson would say. When we succeed, the result is a universe that is a little more whole, but we are imperfect beings with imperfect knowledge, so we need help in choosing what is true and not being swayed by what we wish would be true. We need help in choosing love because we have to distinguish love from longing, desire, lust, and all those other things. We don't always get it right, do we? And I think that's what religion is about. The word itself, religion, comes from a Latin word. Here's your other language lesson for the morning. Ligare. Ligare is related to the word for ligament. It connects, it binds, it holds together. In ancient terms, it meant the customs and rituals a society used to hold society together. Think in some ways of our American civil religion. We all learn the Pledge of Allegiance and to put our hands on our heart. We have these rituals and customs. But I want to go deeper to its more basic meaning that In a sense, true religion is about trying to connect body and soul, person to person, truth to love. And in a sense, it is always just about us. It's only humans that we know of who have religion. We have no knowledge of any dandelion religions, of any snake cults among the snakes. The Anglican Archbishop of the 20th century, William Temple, wisely noted when he said, we are gravely mistaken to think that, that, that God is at all interested in our religion. To put it bluntly, religion is about how we live amongst each other in this world and to do a better job of it. Religion is not about believing in anything. If we love the truth, truly love it, believing in God, 
doesn't count. Because if you did and you didn't do that, you wouldn't be doing the right thing. And if you did all that and didn't believe in God, you would be doing the right thing. So your belief in God is immaterial to religion. It neither makes it true or makes it false. So why are we even talking about God then? Go forth and love the truth. Be gone. I'm out of a job. Well, what if we could do a better job of being human beings, of knitting that truth with that love, if the idea of God, if believing in God helped us to do it? That's the question I'm asking. We approach this task, this notion of God, always, I think, with a presumption that, well, Blaise Pascal came up with. Does anyone here remember Pascal's wager? early enlightenment thinker, rationalist of the first rank. And he put it this way. We cannot know whether God exists or not, but we are better off believing there is one than there isn't. Now, I would agree except that we disagree on why. If you're Pascal, it works this way. If there is no God, You lose nothing by believing or disbelieving. If there is a God, though, and you don't believe in God, you're in for a bad time. As he put it, if you gain, you gain all. If you lose, you lose nothing. This is where I think he's in the wrong place. Now, he is playing the odds, and I appreciate that. We none of us have purchase on enough knowledge to say there is or there isn't such a thing as God. What gets overlooked in Pascal's formula is an assumption that God cares what you think. Pascal assumes, as everyone else did then, and most people still do now, that God really cares if you think about him or her. It's a condition for getting into whatever there is of heaven. I don't think so. I disagree. The advantage to believing in God is not that God approves of you thinking of him or her or them. It's entirely different. And the good news is this is not a new idea. It's a very old one, but it's advanced. It's it's improved. It's a new and improved version of a very old idea. Some of you know well that Paul of Tarsus, sometimes called St. Paul, in his letter to the church in in Corinth, the first one notably, likened the church to a person with many limbs and members. And he used this argument to say, why should the eye feel better than the feet and the hand feel better than the... And the whole idea is that it was one body, though many different parts were present and all of the parts were important. As he put it, just as the body is one and has many parts, all the members of the body, though many, are one body. It's a great image when you think about it, very powerful, and it's still powerful. Science has refined our knowledge of biology. We know about things like DNA and stem cells, that the brain is immensely intricate, and that chemicals such as hormones affect our thoughts and moods, but guess what? No matter how much we know about the body, and we know a lot more, we can transplant parts of it, We can do immense things that Paul could never imagine. We still cannot assemble a person from parts and make it live, as Mary Shelley tried to indicate gruesomely in her book, Frankenstein. Why? Because the thing that's missing is the part we cannot create, and that's the mind. Consciousness. And of course, for Paul, that was God or Christ. But I think Paul actually got his idea from an earlier fellow, Plato, who wrote a bunch of, actually he said a bunch of things that other people wrote down, and many of them were lost for a time, including a little dialogue called the Timaeus, named after the person who is doing most of the talking. And Plato posited in Timaeus, and I got this from a great philosopher friend of mine, that God is to the universe as the mind is to the body. Like Paul, Plato had limited information about this analogy, so his further conclusions don't really work either. But if we apply this 
body and mind analogy to what we know about biology today, the idea makes even more sense now. We know not only about DNA and stem cells, we know about cells. We know that they're born and that they die, and yet somehow, even as we're sloughing off cells all day long, we still manage to be a person. Our individual cells don't make us, and yet together they do make us. We know that all of them are related, though some of them are bones and some of them are blood. At the microscopic level, something Plato and Paul could never see, we also know that there are viruses and bacteria living inside us as friends on our skin, keeping us healthy. We have no observable knowledge of these microbes. We can't see them, we can't hear them, we can't touch them. But yet they are there and part of us in a way that makes us who we are. Now, what's key to my notion of God here is not only can we not see them, they can't see us either. That is to say, all those creatures that live on us and in us, all the cells that comprise us have no awareness that you exist. Not even a little bit. Do you remember Gary Larson's Far Side cartoons? Creepy fellow. I still remember them because they stick out. So there he is with a little cartoon called Agnostic Fleas. One panel shows two fleas amidst the hairs on some body of some animal. And one flea is looking at the other and saying in the caption, you know, I'm not sure there really is a dog. You got the joke, obviously. There they are on the dog, but not positive that there was a dog. I think fleas actually do know there is a dog because they go from dog to dog. But it's a cinch that the dust mites that live on your eyelashes right now have no awareness of your existence. And until I told you, you didn't want to know about them either, did you? (laughs) Nor do the bacteria that live in our intestines, which digest your food and give you life and protect you from illness, they don't know you're there. That knowledge is of no consequence to them. Their ignorance does not inhibit their function, and yet we exist with them, and their lives are deeply mingled in our own, just as we do not care whether the life within us knows about us or believes in us, No God that is a cosmic mind knows or cares that we're here. So why believe in this God? Because it's not the idea of getting into heaven. Because as a creature who chooses on purpose, we have a disproportionate impact on our world. There are six billion and some people on the planet, and yet we who are outnumbered by beetles, mosquitoes, microbes, and vast other species have an impact on this planet that is profound. So profound that we are busy trying to deny we even have this impact because it isn't really getting warmer, is it? Our consciousness gives our choices more power than the unconscious choices other creatures make. And with that power, as all students of Spider-Man know, comes great responsibility. Our consciousness means we have a duty not only to ourselves, but beyond ourselves. And that's where the idea of God, yes, that's where the idea of God becomes important. Our human consciousness must be open to something greater than ourselves, or we will come to think of ourselves as God, forgetting that we are not in charge of the world, but merely a part of it. For me, mere humanism, atheism, is not enough. We need a larger mind than ours for us to be the people we ought to be. This can happen only when we believe that everything in the universe really is connected, part of a single body. 
And we benefit from believing this is so, not because it will save us, but because it will help us save it. Because it counteracts the tendency of a mere, and I do mean mere humanism, to narrow our view to what concerns only us and to exalt ourselves as the pinnacle of the world. It does so in four ways, and I'll sketch them very briefly. God gives the universe meaning, not just us. If there is a cosmic mind, it allows us to believe that love and beauty and justice are not just figments of our imagination or passing or transient hormones, but embedded in the fabric of reality itself. If the cosmic mind can love as we love, the universe is filled with love. If the cosmic mind can conceive of justice, then writing injustice becomes a duty, not just an option. We can also say, that as our minds feel these emotions and know these things which are transient and partial, is there not the possibility of a universal mind that holds them perpetually in reality? This, as Aquinas might say, everyone knows to be God. Here's my personal slogan for why I believe in God. God is at least excuse me, the universe is at least as smart as I am. Think about that. We go around thinking that the universe is inert, dead, useless, beyond value, except for a few of us scattered flecks of flotsam on planet Earth. Is it not dreadful and dreary to think that the universe is meaningless except for you, me, and I'm not even so sure about you? It is an act of faith, there's no proof, but why not believe the universe has meaning? You have the choice. Why would you not make it? The idea of God gives us acceptance. In other words, we belong to God no matter what. Whether we believe in God or not, whether we care or not, our believing does not make God happier, nor our disbelieving unhappier. Our beliefs don't save us or damn us, but what they do give us is a sense of belonging to a whole that is larger than ourselves and that we are as important as anything to the ultimate well-being of the world. We have no need to justify our existence. We have no need to doubt our value. We have no reason to think ourselves banished. We belong. We belong to the universe, and the universe holds us. God gives us purpose. Our task as humans is to bring truth and love together, which is, believe it or not, the purpose of God as well, on the cosmic level. We are partners. We are born. We have no form, we have no purpose whatsoever, but then over a period of years, through parents and friends and others, we gradually become a person. We grow a soul, as A. Powell Davies says, from which I take the phrase. We can thus think that the same may well take place on a larger scale. God turns potential into actual, unites truth with love. This is what the universe is about, creating, connecting, bringing together, and we are just one part of that process. Do I know this to be true? Of course not. But let's remember where I started. Every day we decide, without any evidence, that life matters. We have to believe it does or we would make life intolerable. The idea of God as a mind that penetrates the whole is unprovable, but it is consistent with all our knowledge. No facts need to be ignored or denied, and it gives us a purpose in life. Finally, God gives us immortality. You were not expecting that, were you? I'm not saying you're going to heaven. I have no knowledge there. I wouldn't bet on it, but I have no knowledge. But let's look at it this way. Let's admit that any possible cosmic mind precedes us in time and space and goes beyond us in time and place so as to be practically infinite. And if we're part of that body for a while, what we think and do becomes part of that larger mind. 
I want you to think of your life, your being, as like a moment in the divine mind. Neuroscience knows that our thoughts are not just little transient experience, but every time we have a thought, little neurons in your brain fire and go in a certain direction, down a little pathway that they've never been before. And that pathway remains even after the thought has stopped. That's how we become conscious ourselves, by building thought upon thought, memory upon memory, until we become a person. Our lives form paths in the cosmic mind so that when our particular life is over, the path we created still remains. A mentor of mine put it this way, we perish but live on imperishably, held in the mind and heart of the cosmos with perfect fidelity. Our place in the universe is secure, my friends. Our value is priceless, whether we believe it or not. But how much richer would our lives be, broader, more lively, more satisfying, if we can bring ourselves to believe that we are, in fact, part of something larger than ourselves, our own species, even our own planet. Some dusty day long ago, a ragged parade of people stumbled down a hill outside Jerusalem. Only a few were actually there, and some of them were smirking with derisive laughter, but a few people remembered. And today, you now know a story to which you have no connection, personally, whatsoever. We all would like to believe that something about us will endure that something will outlive our lives. And if you wish to live completely, you have to believe this. For why would we live on purpose if we didn't think it mattered, not just to you, but the universe itself? You can believe this. You can. It's allowed. It's permitted. And what's more, it's wise, it's right, it's good, and it's sane. And if you wish to live completely, you must. Astride our donkeys, looking for all the world like fools on fools' errands we may be, but whatever we are, we are a moment in a universe that is alive, teeming with thoughts held together by love. You are on your way from time to timeless, from life to eternity. Hosanna. Hosanna. And amen.